Detroit Tigers top prospects. We're going to go through the farm system today on the call up. I'm Arm Layton. He's Jack McMullen. We switched up a little bit here. So we were going to do mock draft and then Detroit Tigers. Since we did a little bit of mock draft talk on the Just Baseball show, and I know some of you wonderful people are overlap listeners. Thank you so much to the, those of you who are. We want to give you a little bit of, of a break and then also go into different detail on the mock draft on Friday. And also, I got the Tiger system done, so why not do it now? Jack, there's some guys that you've seen recently. There's some names that you know you saw last year. And then there's just some names that we've talked about plenty. So this is a pretty fun farm system for us to go through. Yeah, I think one through one through 10 looks really good. 11 through 15 is all right. And then mm -hmm. you kind of start looking for scraps here. Mm -hmm. But like those scraps can turn into big league pieces. So I, I'd say they have done a good job. What I will say is Alavila. I know he had his issues building a major league baseball team. He drafted pretty well at the end. Like he found some late round gems in Scooble and Kerry Carpenter. Um, and like his first round picks, you know, albeit not all are great. Most of them were semi hits. Like I'm thinking about, you know, the lowest end of the hit was probably Matt Manning in the last, yeah. you know, six, seven years. But Spencer Torkelson, big leaguer, Riley Green, big leaguer. Um, Casey Mize, big leaguer, looks healthy, looks really good right now. Jackson Job, Jace Young, his last two first round picks, like those are two of their top five prospects. It, it's it's crazy to think that like with all the issues that were going on in the Alavila regime, he was drafting really well at the top. And I will say, it's probably easy to find hits when you're drafting as high as he was. Like they were always in the top ten and. You know, two of those guys that I just named were number one overall. I was going to say several were, were number one. Several were were top five. Uh, I think almost all of them were top five. Riley Green was the pick that I think was really good. Even though that's a number five pick, that was a really good nab there. I think. And, and I thought Job was a good nab too. Like it's, oh, it's yeah. hard to take a high school right-hander in the top three. Absolutely. I think that was an absolutely great pick too. So no, they, he's done, relative, especially relative to, to what he was doing elsewhere. Definitely the draft was kind of a saving grace. And I do think, you know, a lot of people are going to talk about the, the the Max Clark selection versus White Langford, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at the other picks that Scott Harris you know made in this draft, we're going to talk about McGonagall, who's back and healthy, by the way. And guess what he's done? He's hit right away. Yeah. Uh, and then some of the other names that they went a little bit later in the draft on that I'm very intrigued on. I think Harris is going to replenish a lot of depth in this farm system. I think he's going to do really well with the middle rounds and, and continue to, to fill this thing up. But uh, I, I think the Tigers farm is all, you know generally in a good spot, but I do agree with you. It's one of the steeper drop-offs after the top 15. That said, it's, it's a very, very solid top 10, especially without Colt Keith graduating just yet. A hundred percent. So let's jump in to the names to watch a guy who's going to graduate quite soon. And, it was actually looked pretty good so far, all things considered. I haven't checked in on the numbers over the last week. That's the thing that sucks about it being this early in the season, man. Like sometimes we'll be on the show. I say, oh, this guy was, you know, this guy's off to a good start. And then someone will say, no, he's not. Because he went 0 for 6. His OPS went from 900 to, you know, 680 or yeah. something like that. But I've watched the, the Wenzel Perez at bats that I have watched have been good. I, and he's looked comfortable and he's looked like a guy that could be a utility slash depth piece. So far, the numbers are pretty good. Um, I, I don't know what they are just in the big leagues, but if you can mind AAA in the big leagues, pretty good. I think he's a bench utility piece. Yes. So seven or 10 games, he's got seven hits. He's hitting 270 with an 806 OPS in his first 10 major league games. So that's nice. Um, fourth outfielder, Wenzel Perez is like, Totally a fourth outfielder. And, and you know what? That's that's enough to be a names to watch for sure. Tyler Madison is a guy that I was really excited for, but Tommy John is going to have him out until about the all-star break. Madison was a guy that was a middle round pick, early round, mm -hmm. eh, fourth round. I, I consider fourth round middle round. I think mm -hmm. early round is one through three. Um, but Madison, a, a middle round pick out of Bryant. So what are you getting there? He was a starting pitcher at Bryant. They move him to the pen and he ticks up big time. And it's mid 90s. He can flirt with the high 90s. And he's got that curveball slider combination where he's leaning into that one turn of his wrist. He's not trying to figure out a changeup because he doesn't need it. 
Um, and he was electric last year between high A and double A. I was excited to see him probably get his first big league shot this year, but not the case. TJ, such is life in baseball and with pitchers in 2024. So that stinks. He, he, he probably cracks a top 15 if, if not for um, the, the injury. Uh, that's a guy that goes all the way back to you know, my first job on uh, in the NECBL uh, with wow. the Newport goals. And I love the way he threw back then, but back then it was more kind of pitch ability. And, you know, there was, there was some stuff. I mean, the breaking ball was always there, uh, but seeing the way the fastball has trended, as you mentioned, since he went to the bullpen, great characteristics to it too. He's got great ride on the fastball. And I'm sure he's going to come back and, and be just fine, but yeah. the curveball and the changeup both being, really solid pitches. This is a unique profile to me. And the reason why I think he would have been in the top 15 is because he's not just your run of the mill reliever. He's a multi inning option here. He's a guy that, you know, you may ultimately want to stretch back out to three, four innings and can be that opener. It could be a, a piggyback guy. I think he can be a Swiss army type of piece, not quite a swing man type, but I think the stuff is good enough to potentially be in leverage, but he also is durable enough yeah, durable as we as he comes back from tommy john i should right. say you know just is able to handle the workload across multiple innings well enough you know on pretty frequent outings from what i've seen over multiple years uh to to be able to kind of play this unique role there so i think madison's going to be a great piece for them at the end of the day hope so yeah another proximity guy is eddie slaynard who um i i made a note off the top leonard was a 40-man clearance i think i made the note off the top of winsill perez's write-up um if Leonard was healthy, he was probably the guy that got the call, but he wasn't in Paris, was in the right place at the right time. He was available at the right time, and that's why he's in the big leagues right now. Eddie's Leonard really has nothing left to prove in the minor leagues, and it was a one man's trash is another man's treasure type situation. He was DFA'd in like a 40-man crunch uh, last deadline by the Dodgers. Detroit purchases him. He goes nuts in a 40-game sample. Hit 300, slugged 530 with Toledo. And he looked like a guy that could jump up and play on a non-competitive Tigers team. He didn't get that opportunity. He started slow. He got hurt. I think it's an oblique thing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an oblique strain. Um, but Leonard is a guy that can play second, third, center, left, and short to varying abilities. Like I wouldn't love if he was at short every day. I wouldn't love if he was in center every day, but he screams big league utility guy. Yep. And had a really good spring training too. So yeah, you could say, Oh boy, he was off to a slow start, you know, in, in triple a, but in a larger sample of spring training, 18 games in no PS over a thousand. And he was striking out just at an 11% clip. So, you know, I wonder if that oblique was kind of nagging him before. And then it really ended up becoming an issue you know, uh, I, I, the seventh of the month was the last game he played. So uh, I'm I'm interested to see when, when he comes back and, and how they use him. But I'm, I'm with you. I think he looks like he could be a nice utility piece. For sure. Uh, Enrique Jimenez, he's a young catcher that walked a ton in the DSL and hit enough to be notable. And that's what I have on Enrique Jimenez. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it, right? So, uh, but when you're an 18 year old and, you know, putting up the numbers. He was 17 last year when he put up these numbers. EVs are are light at this point, but again, he was 17. Uh, contact rates were above average, ran a pretty low chase rate, and sprayed the ball you know, all over the yard as a switch hitting catcher. I'm, I'm definitely going to be intrigued. We got to see more and everything, but uh, I, I think there's plenty to be excited about when, when, when he comes over to the complex just to see what it looks like and, and get him stateside. But there's definitely a name to watch when you put up good numbers and you're switching and catcher. Yeah. Another guy is Brant Herter. You might see the name Herter when you're scrolling the MLB at bat app or the ESPN app when you see probable pitchers in like June or July if they run into injury issues. And you could say, who is that? Brant Herter is a big guy, 6'6, 250 pounds. You think, okay, 6'6, 250 lefty. He probably throws mid 90s, right? No. He's a sinker at 91. He's got a sweeper. For the most part over his last couple of starts, he's really only been sinker sweeper. And that's okay. Like that, that is absolutely spot start type guy. He's a big guy that I wish threw bigger, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. I wish he was a bit more of a power pitcher, but he can be a plug and play spot starter that gets a bunch of early contact on the ground. And all of a sudden he's through six innings in a major league debut. And, and the good part is, you know, 
it's not like a back and forth from triple a spot starter situation you can have him in the bullpen as a, a more of a left-handed specialist because as you mentioned it's more, mostly sinker sweeper and last year lefties hit below 200 against him and, and could not slug at all 224 slug last year left on left because of the way that his stuff works in opposite directions. So, you know, you could have him as that lefty specialist for you. And then if you ever need somebody to plug in and, and give you four or five innings, you know, he's capable of doing that or, or even more. He's very stretched out, fills up the zone enough. Um, he's just a good, you, you can't have, every organization wants to have a, a Brant Herter, a guy that, like you mentioned, you could plug in and, and you're not toast. Uh, yeah. But th- what's nice about him is, you know, he can also fill a different role in the meantime. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Wilmer Flores, now the reliever. If he was a starter, I think he probably cracks the top 15. Wilmer Flores has gotten off to a really rough start this year. And it was, you know, spring training, like, hey, he grabbed 101, but then he couldn't really throw a strike. And in Toledo to this point, he hasn't been able to throw a strike. 10 walks and 11 and two thirds innings. This was the best move for Wilmer Flores. It's just crazy how not far but far we are removed from 2022 when he was maybe the breakout pitcher in the minor leagues and he was walking two hitters per nine. Now, yeah, awesome, it's 100 and he's got that crazy curveball. But frankly, like I watched him throw several times last week, two weeks ago. I had no confidence that he knew where it was going, which is bizarre. And I don't know how you go from 2022 Wilmer Flores to this Wilmer Flores. No, I'm with you. It's 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 weird, uh, for sure. Especially because of like you said, what he was doing as a starter. Um yeah, like he was he was a command oriented starter that had pretty loud stuff. And now the stuff has gotten louder, but the command is like gone. It, it's not even partially there. It's gone. It, it it almost seems borderline like yips at this point. It, it, like uh-huh. in this season so far. It just yeah. And it's not yips because he's getting through innings, but there's just so many non-competitive pitches. He's, it's a testament to him that he can, and his stuff that he can kind of recapture it mm-hmm. and and get through the inning. But I don't know. I've never really seen. It, I can't think of a time recently where I've seen a guy be so around the zone as a starter, and then now as a reliever, not that long after, just be so inconsistent and throw so many non-competitive pitches. Hopefully he can get back to it. Cause like you said, this stuff is, is, is pretty crazy. Cause that's not the template of guys that move to the bullpen. The guys that no. move to the bullpen are the ones that aren't around the zone. And they think, okay, you can survive over an inning. Like you really never see command oriented guys move to the no. pen, but no. he's a unique case. Blake Dickerson left-hander has yet to throw a professional inning. Really interesting kind of draft story about Blake Dickerson. Virginia native was going to Virginia Tech, felt like very cut and dry. Hey, I'm going to go be a Hokie. 12th round, I think, came around in San Diego last summer, paid him 500 grand. And he said, okay, let's do it. Then Detroit acquired him for $500,000 worth of international bonus pool money. So they really just like allocated the bonus to Blake Dickerson. Um, Blake Dickerson, I watched several perfect game showcases. I watched a couple of high school YouTube clipped starts. Everything was missing up in arm side. Yeah. He's very lanky. He's very whippy. He's only 91 at 6'6", 210, but he's 6'6", 210, and it's very whippy. So if he can tick up a little bit, and I think everybody's expecting a guy like that too, um, it becomes a battle with himself because the delivery might be too weird to, to time up. It's pretty low effort though. You mentioned like he's whippy. It's pretty like, it seems like it's something that he should be able to kind of rein in. And yeah. and I think it's a fun developmental challenge. And if you don't, you know, if you weren't really planning to use that half a million in bonus pool, yeah, go get the six, five lefty who, you know, it looks like I don't have the data on it, but it looks like a fastball from the video I saw that, that rides a little bit too. Sure. It looks like you mentioned the whip. It looks like he's just spinning it pretty well with that arm speed. So I mean, that's a guy I'd love to take a shot on. And at 19 years old, six, five, you know, a lot of times those lefties takes a little bit longer to kind of control those limbs. Yeah. Um, and then last name to watch is Max Anderson, who I assume would be in the 16 range for you. Right around there. Yeah. Yeah. Max Anderson was uh, with second round pick this past year out of the university of Nebraska 
it was a breakout. It was a Mitch Trubisky type thing where it was a one year true breakout. Um, but the breakout was exceptional in the Big Ten, hit 414, 21 homers, 29 punch outs in 57 mm-hmm. games with Nebraska. So he rides that in, has a decent start in Lakeland, has gotten off to a really slow start in West Michigan. Um, but he's probably limited to second base. He's got exceptional bat to ball skills, it seems. And the question is, is the power real with Wood? It's probably not 20. It might be 10 to 15. And, you know, the, the, this is the classic field of hit versus the plate discipline. The field of hits good. The plate discipline undermines it a little bit. Can he cut down on the chase? He has in the early going this year relative to what we saw last year, which is encouraging. And I do think, you know, it's just kind of hard to hit in, in, in West Michigan right now. So that, that's something that, you know, as it gets warmer, hopefully he will too. Uh, but he's definitely a, 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 an intriguing offensive piece with what he did last year. And if, if he can get closer to the 20 home run marker, and I think you could see an everyday player there. And I think there's the potential for that as he works to elevate a bit more because the EVs are solid. Gotcha. We're getting to the top 15, a name that we've talked about plenty. And a guy that you've seen a little bit, I think, right over the last couple of seasons once he's healthy, Dylan Dingler. Dingler, I loved him out of the draft. Second round pick, a guy that, you know, you look at what he was doing at Ohio State, you know, playing center field then catching, uh, you know, you could dream on on some some power there as well. He could motor, so athletic, big arm. All the tools were there. And we saw in the early going and, and spurts of his professional career, this guy can play. He's had some horrible injury luck. It's It's yep. been a uh, handmate. It's been knee surgery. I think some concu- a concussion in there, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, that's just how it goes sometimes, especially for catchers. I still feel really confident about him being a backup catcher at the very least and like a good one, but I feel like he's going to be a guy that can, he's kind of between that right now. I think at this present moment, he's between either a really good backup or like a second or third division starter and and that, you know, average big league starting catcher. And I think he can still get to that average big league starting catcher because you have a plus arm behind the dish. uh, You have the above average power. You have athleticism. He's a good receiver, good makeup, works with staffs well. I ultimately think he figures out a way to, you know, be an everyday catcher. But a lot of times, as we see, sometimes these catchers, it's 27, 28 years old where they finally settle in and become an everyday guy. So can I tell you, I thought the athleticism would translate to a lot more field of hit than it has at this point. And I, I'm not sure like why I thought that, but with him, I just, I, I saw him in college and then I saw him in high A in 2021. And I was like, okay, this guy's just a natural gifted athlete. And I think natural mm-hmm. gifted athletes, I just immediately assume good field to hit, or at least a, a field to hit that can progress. And it unfortunately just hasn't progressed. And is it because he's missed a bunch of time? Maybe. Is it because he's trying to learn how to catch level by level? Maybe, but I don't know. You're at AAA again this year. You spent about a month there last year. Um, this is a full year in triple, and then you see what you got in uh, in Carson Kelly, and I think Dingler can absolutely be a backup timeshare catcher at the basic at the big league level. I definitely thought the the uh, bat to ball would be better, and and kind of just as the more I watched, it, again I don't know how much of that was was injury related or whatever, but you know, just just kind of lacked some of the the quickness. He does provide power, like he does hit the ball hard. But there's sometimes not as much you know, whip with the barrel as you'd like to see, and he's a little long to the ball. So I think at the end of the day, the hit tool is going to be below average. But again, if you can provide above average power, hopefully he can improve the plate discipline a little bit. You can pallet it when you're a really good defender and do all the other things that I think Dingor is going to be able to do behind the dish. Yeah. 14, another uh, guy that you had to go watch the perfect game showcases to get mm-hmm. some info on. Paul Wilson, left-handed pitching prospect, who was selected in the 2023 draft. Another part of the reason why the Tigers wanted to go under slot and, and over slot with their later picks, they almost went twice this the slot value in the third round to get Paul Wilson. His father, Trevor Wilson, was a big league pitcher for parts of eight seasons. I mean, when you give out double the slot value for a prep pitcher, usually there's some upside to dream on there. And I think that's exactly what the case is with Paul Wilson. He's 6'3", he's southpaw, He's got plenty of room, I think, to continue to get stronger and be a little bit more physical. He's athletic on the mound. Uh, the, the fastball has good characteristics. The slider looks like it could ultimately be a plus pitch. He's mixed in some good curveballs and you know the low 70s. 
And I think that's another aspect that is that is intriguing. Uh, but the command is, you know, work in progress. And it, as is the case for a lot of taller lefties. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be what the sticking point is. But when you have the fastball and the slider like that, a curveball that he's mixed in, I think there's a lot to like here. And there's a reason why you know the, the, the Tigers shelled out what was almost first round money, early second round money. How about an arm from the Northwest? You never see pitchers from the Northwest. You only see hitters. And I think that kids are so disincentivized in the Northwest from pitching because like all of a sudden the kid that hasn't hit puberty with just took you 300 feet. And it's like, what's going on here? Like the ball shouldn't fly like this. So credit to him for being good enough when he was 11 years old to not lose confidence entirely. Um, But I'm I'm sure that comes from having a dad that was a big leaguer for a good bit of time. And um, yeah, I always root for my pitchers from the Northwest and uh, pretty easy to uh, get to driveline in Kent, Washington. It's probably what, two, three hours from Oregon city, Oregon. I have no idea. And I don't know when we're going to see him throw. Um, he's yet to throw professionally. I'm not sure what, you know, what the latest is on him in that regard, but uh, I do know that the Tigers are excited about him and, and a guy that I think they're going to treat with care uh, given the investment, but also, you know, I think are very interested in, you know, what the debut is going to look like and, and ready to probably see him climb and, and be, you know, one of the higher upside guys in their, in their farm from a pitching perspective you know, pitching side of things. I'm just interested to see how they handle him, what the endings are going to look like, you know, when, you know, when he's going to start to really be unleashed. But for now, we just got to wait and see. Yep. 13, a guy you saw recently, mm-hmm. right-hander, Kyder Montero, who's in AAA right now. He's a tough one to peg for me in terms of where he ultimately settles in because you look at the stuff and you could easily see a big league starter. It's above average fastball, above average slider at least an average curveball and he's had a changeup that's flash i mean last year it was very useful for him this year it has not been useful for him at all uh and then the command's kind of the same thing sometimes it looks average sometimes it looks below that you saw him recently you know how did you and i know he threw well how did you come away feeling about kyder montero i loved him and i was talking to the indie coaching staff when they got back to town and as simple as you can put it the consensus was he's got some shit to him Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what that means, it means that he can compete. And it was um, him up against Paul Skeens. And, you know, like that'll level a lot of guys up when they see that they are part of a marquee pitching matchup. And he he pitched the part like he really looked the part. The fastball was jumping on guys and the slider, man, like he was dotting the slider east and west. And it was really impressive. I feel like when he does get the call it really is going to come down to slider command. Mm -hmm. If he's a one pitch guy, the fastball is not good enough to survive on that. And he's like kind of spraying the slider, but if he can put it inside and outside of right-handed hitters and left-handed hitters, um, I I think you could see this guy really carve in a debut like that. and, And in a couple, you know, big league starts off the top. So I saw a good slider day from Kyder Montero. I'm excited to see how many more good slider days he has upcoming. And this is an easy story to root for. You've got a 2016 $40,000 IFA guy. Like those guys are not supposed to be in a position they are in in 2024, eight years after they sign. But, you know, here we are. Kyder Montero, you know, much like Wenzel Perez is, is looking like he'll debut at some point. And, you know, I love what you mentioned about the story. Left unprotected twice in the Rule 5 draft before being added to the 40-man this past November. Uh, I I think that slider could easily tick closer to the plus territory if he commands it, like you said. So far this year, it's definitely been that pitch for him where, I mean, it's been able to get him out of a lot of tough spots. But the curveball being there for him, too, is is, is nice to see. I I think that the slider and the fastball alone give him a reliever floor. And yeah. you imagine in one inning spurts, that fastball probably plays closer to a, cl- a plus pitch as well. Uh, right. And But at, at this point, he looks like a guy that could be a back end of the rotation starter. I think at the very least, though, you have a swingman, seventh inning type that you know could be a really nice piece. For sure. Number 12, recently acquired at the last trade deadline for Michael Lorenzen, mm-hmm. Al Yuli, second baseman. Another guy that's a unique case that is a little difficult to peg, but there's plenty to like, especially from an offensive perspective. Originally a shortstop, 
that ship has sailed. He's playing second base now, but in the time that he was working on his shortstop defense, really, I think, ended up improving his range to the degree that it can play well at second base. So I think he actually looks like he could be an average defender there. The arm is more than strong enough, I think, above average at second base, and he's even able to plug in at third. What you're looking at, though, is the offensive ability. I think there's an above average field to hit. I think there's above average plate discipline. And the EVs are are fine. I, I think they're they're roughly average. He's been hitting the ball even harder this year. Uh, he's not going to be a guy that ultimately taps into a ton of game power. Uh, I think that's something he's working on. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's it's going to be fringy game power. And then the defense is kind of is what it is. I think the instincts kind of push him up a little bit higher too. He's f- efficient and effective on the base on the base paths. You see the instincts uh, in the field as well. Uh, I, I think there's a, a path to him being an everyday second baseman, but at the very least, he crushes lefties, and I think he could be a platoon, you know, multi infielder, you know, that could play second, third, and, and and demolish lefties and do some of the little things. He's he's unremarkable in a good way, like nothing he does is going to be like whoa, and and mm-hmm. no batted balls. I know you mentioned the EVs have gotten better, but none of the batted balls that he's got are going to make you say whoa. Like he's not going to kill a ball, and he'll sneak what he snuck six out last year in 75 games he'll sneak some out we've got 45 in the future but um yeah the thing that kind of gets me about him is like he's just a guy that'll make you sleep soundly at Mm -hmm. night and and you can never have enough of those guys as second baseman he's just 21 years old too right five hundred thousand dollar ifa and by the phillies and I think a specific target for for Harris, the type of player that Harris likes, right, is these these guys that can hit and have a good feel for the zone. Uh, the reason why I'm I'm dreaming on a little bit more power is he had some some pretty serious back issues, if I'm not mistaken, kind of going into his professional career, and then has had some other ailments. I mean, this guy's only played, I want to say, like 177 games uh, as a pro since 2021. So we're talking about a guy that yeah was 177. Uh, th- that you know hasn't had a ton of run just yet and just turned 21. So I do think that there's you know just getting healthy, getting his body right. There's been a few other ailments and injuries that he's dealt with as well. Uh, I-, I do think that there could be more power in the tank there as he just gets more comfortable and more healthy. But even if the power is more in the 40 range, I think the above average hit, above average plate discipline, and the, the little things that he's able to do on top of that could make him you know an average regular. Gotcha. 11. Guy you saw recently as well. He, I know he didn't have a great series against you guys, if I'm not mistaken, but also friend of the program, really nice guy. Justice Bigby, outfielder in AAA, I, it was one of the breakout hitters last year, and I think one of the biggest surprises, not only in the Tiger system, but I would say just in, in minor league baseball, uh, really underrated player, 19th round pick, 555th overall. But the, the field of hit, for a guy that you know was a 19th round pick stood out and the evs were really good too i, I always talk about him as like a data darling relative to a lot of other hitters that you're going to see in his range i mean the, the batted ball data is on par with a lot of top 100 prospects i think just some of the concern is is it going to translate to professional baseball he struggles to pull the ball in the air the ground ball rates are a little elevated and if you look at his spray charts almost everything is going the other way and i know that's kind of his plan and that's kind of what he likes to do and he talked about that on the show but i do have some concerns once you get to the big league level they're just going to start ripping you inside hard stuff inside are you going to be able to not only turn that around but turn that around in the air uh I, that's something that i think could catch up to him there is a lot of weak contact in the infield but this guy can can really crush him the other way, can crush him to center field in a 90th percentile exit velocity, almost at 106 last year with above average contact rates and put up ridiculous numbers across three levels. So there's plenty to like, but with limited defensive value as well, you know, below average arm eh, range out there, a lot of pressure on the bat and yeah, you know, the plate discipline isn't great. So he's going to have to hit for power and he's going to have to hit for average. I think he can. I think he showed us that he can. And he's already been heating up a little bit this year and over the last 10 games. Now, 21 game sample, have AAA pitchers been busting him inside? Is that why we've seen the struggles or no? It's definitely part of it. Uh, he's definitely been getting a lot more pitches inside and fastballs have now chewed him up a little bit more. So uh, that is that is definitely, I think, contributing to the slower start. But we've seen him now in the last 10 games. It's small sample, but he's hitting 324, 872 OPS. Maybe he's adjusting back a bit, 
But I, I do think that that's something that is going to be challenged at the AAA level and then even more so at the big league level. Yeah, it's tough because I, I watched him for a full week when he was like clearly not right. I don't want to say lost because that's unfair. It was just early in counts. It was soft contact and then the at-bat was over. Like I really yep. didn't get a feel for Justice Bigby over six games because like there wasn't enough time to get a feel for him versus a guy like Jace Young or Malloy. They give you time to get a feel for him. When Bigby's going right, he's not punching out. He's also not walking that much. Like he's going to attack an 0 one 1 pitch and he's going to hammer it. And you're going to be like, whoa, that happened very quickly. He is the perfect guy to have come up fifth in an ambush. Like you've got a three run inning, chances are Justice Bigby was somewhere in the middle of that. And he like, he capitalized when the pitcher didn't have his full focus on that next pitch. And that's the thing. So I, I like, I like that he can, you know, ambush and and take advantage of that but there's also the the aspect as you mentioned of kind of giving away at bats and you know you don't want to do that with an aggressive you know nature as well so i'm 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 a believer in the bat though still like the way he's able to handle velocity still for the most part when it's out over the plate and i think he's made some changes to be able to turn around velocity a little bit better inside uh, and he's always been quick and direct enough to handle velo it's just again being inside and getting tied up and getting beat in there a bit it seems like he's made some subtle adjustments there. He's starting to elevate a little bit more. And uh, if, if he fixes you know that little blue zone and or becomes more selective to where, hey, I'm going to you know shrink, I'm going to look out more, and then with two strikes, you know, then, then I'll have to cover a little bit more of the plate, we could see him be more consistent. Uh, but I do think you hit the nail on the head with the early week contact. That's just – pitchers are going to exploit that and, and you know, get you to get yourself out early in ABs. So, you know, I'd love to see him cut down on the chase a bit more. What's interesting is over the last 10 games or so, specifically the fastball, 15 games, let's even go. The, the fastball chase rate continues to dwindle. So if I cut it down to 10, this is actually crazy. He has not chased a four-seam fastball in his last 10 games. That's awesome. So you're seeing a tangible change here. We talked to him on the show. Like he's a really smart hitter. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a guy that, worked really hard to continue to get better and better and climb out of what Western Carolina and yeah. get 395 there and then do what he did last year. So I'm going to believe on a guy like in a guy like that, being able to continue to make adjustments. And I do think that there's a big league bat in here. Uh, and that's why he's ranked 11th. And, you know, when we get to the top 10, you'll see. So a lot of really good players in the top 10, big B's a big league bat one way or another. Really good. Before we get to number 10, I do want to tell you about our friends at game time. We've all found ourselves in a situation somewhat similar to this. You see that there's like a great pitching matchup, whether it be at the big league level or the minor league level, like RM in New York. He was waiting to see when Carson Palmquist was going to throw in Hartford, Connecticut. So you're willing to drive an hour or two for that. You know, you got a concert going as well. So you go scanning for tickets and there's roadblocks everywhere. It's like, oh, I can't get a good deal to the Yankee game tonight. I can't get a good deal to this concert. Nothing at the last minute list goes on. Let's fix that for you. New friend of the show is Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. You've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, which, you know, you combine it all together. Game Time, in turn, takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I personally have had a great time with Game Time. We've got a rain out in Indy or in Omaha this week. Friday doesn't look good. Guess who's in town? Pacers, Bucks, game three. I might go if game time looks right. Use game time for last minute deals. Save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, list goes on. Yes, you get a lowest price guarantee. Yes, you get panoramic seat views. I like the all-in pricing. It's a toggle, so you know exactly what you're getting into and then being hit with a convenience fee and a processing fee and a fee fee, like all those at checkout. Just stay away. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Use the code JUSTBASEBALL, all caps, one word, for $20 off your first purchase. Again, terms apply, Just Baseball, all caps, for $20 off. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed at game time. It's nice when you got like for you, you got the stadium or the arena right around the corner in New York. It's always great for me because the price is going down as the game gets closer. 
I, sometimes right. I'll just play a game of chicken. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't go down enough and I'll, I'll just hang out. I'm like, I'm not that interested in the game. It's fine. But there's been times where like I was on the fence about going. I just keep checking game time. I'm like, all right, well, I cannot, I cannot pass on this deal. <laughs> I yeah, just hop on the like subway and go to the game. <laughs> flash sale, like the font's green. I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> the flash sales go crazy. So use that promo code to save, save the money on the tickets. I got a couple of buddies use it and uh, save money on their tickets this weekend to the Mets game. Uh, nice. And it helps us out as well. So thank you very much. Let's get into the top 10, which starts with Josue Brasenio. Brasenio is a popular name, a guy I've talked about in the bonus episodes a little bit, which you can, by the way, subscribe to with the link in the episode description. Brasenio has got big power potential, good feel to hit for a 6'4 lefty. I don't think he's sticking behind the dish, though, Jack. That's my concern. $800,000 international free agent in 2022. I, I did the defensive video just was, was tough. He's six, four, he's six, four, 19. That's right at the border of guys that can like stick at the position as is. And then when you're 19, it's even harder to move. Well, I was watching him, you know, the catch and throw the footwork there just wasn't great. The blocking is, is a work in progress. He's improved the receiving there, It's possible that he sticks there, but when I'm looking at a Brasenio, I, I think you got to operate under the assumption that he's moving to first base. And then what does it look like there? Because of course, if he if he sticks a catcher and he's an average catcher, then it's a top one hundred prospect with the with the offensive potential that he has. But I, I just think that there's too much risk to move to first base. That said, he's a top ten prospect in this system because the the batted ball data is really intriguing. I think the power has been sapped a bit because of the Florida State League, and also because his swing is flat. But his swing is flat because I think he wants to be direct to the baseball as a longer levered kid and make contact and he makes pretty frequent contact and he still hits the ball quite hard. So there's a lot of underlying data that, you know, points towards positive things. Uh, but I do have a concern about him being able to create loft and leverage and not have that result in more whiff. And then I also just have concern that he ends up at first base and now you have a lot of pressure on the stick. So you, te- you either texted me about him or I saw a tweet about him and I was like, why is everybody obsessing over this guy? with Omaha, isn't he like 30? That's Jose Briseño, not Josue yeah. Briseño, a catcher as well. I was like, what's yeah. going on? Cra- so that crazy. Your, your Jose Briseño update through five games in the Mexican he's League. He's the Mexican League, league right? Yeah. Yep. Isn't he on Robinson Cano's team? I think so. He's three for 17 so far in the Mexican oh, no. League. So really tough break for Jose Briseño. But Josue Briseño <laughs> is uh, off to a nice little start, sort of, kind of. He's yeah. teammates with Clark and McGonagall. Um, you can speak to his start a little bit more. Like he's he's walking all the time, which is excellent. He's got a 380 OBP. He's hitting 250. Problem is, he's really not hitting for over the fence power or gap to gap power. And that I feel like is a lot of the appeal with a guy like this. That is, <laughs> I mean, as, as you're saying, destined to move off of the catching position. Yeah. So what I've seen so far this year is it just feels like the the contact points deeper okay. and he's longer. And that's the, that's my concern is, you know, I, I, I think that the swing can get a little long and, and that's going to make it really difficult for him to you know continuously tap into that power. And, but the thing is, if the swing is long, you expect more punch outs than he has at this point. Yeah. Well, and that's so to, to mitigate that he's been very direct to the ball and, and very flat and that's resulted in a lot more contact. And, you know, and, and I think, it's long just by nature of the levers. And I don't I just don't know if he has quite enough whip to overcome that. So he's, I think he's trying to find kind of exactly where he wants to make contact, exactly what the best path is for him. And, you know, he's catching it deeper this year. And, and I think as a result, when you're catching it deeper, it, it's a little bit harder to create that loft, right? A lot of the, the home runs that guys are going to hit are going to be a little bit out in front of home plate, especially if you're longer levered. And that's going to allow you to also create more loft as well. Uh, so he's catching it a little bit deeper. His, his, flat, his swing's been a little bit flatter. And so far, you know, you've got an average launch angle below five degrees. So I think that's part of the challenge right here. And I think average hard hit launch angle. Uh, but that said, there's been times where everything is in sync. He looks, he's, he's on time. He catches one out front and scorches him. And he's had several batted balls, 109 miles an hour. There's plenty more room for, for physicality. I think he can get stronger. He's 19. So, you know, as he gets stronger, that could come with a little bit more, you know, bat speed and whip as well and, and just raw power. 
but you mentioned the approach, sub 20% chase rate. He, he also showed a good approach last year. I think that helps a ton. Uh, I, I do think that you can dream on above average power, at least average hit, and then above average plate discipline, which is a really nice offensive profile, even at first base, but you're going to need all of those things to come together. So yeah, I, would, I would love to see him elevate a bit more and, and catch the ball further out front. Uh, but, you know, I think at this point at 19 years old, there's definitely some good indicators so far. Uh, of course, walking more than you're striking out being one of them and the batted ball data being one of them as well. Yeah. Number eight or nine, I should say. Recent guest of the show, another guy that you saw recently and had one of the better at-bats I've seen against Paul Skeen so far yeah, this year. Uh, I mean, uh, what a battle that was. Justin Henry Malloy, outfielder in triple a should get the call at some point you know if they need somebody you figure he's kind of the next man up a t a weird profile to try to peg by the way also one of the best dudes yeah. in professional baseball point yeah. blank period um just such an awesome guy happy go lucky i would say uh and but but a competitor at the same time it's it's a really cool juggle uh it's also some of the best plate discipline you're going to find in the minor leagues and the interesting profile aspect of it is, okay, now he's playing the outfield. No more third. That's fine. I think he can be a fine outfielder. I think he could be average at least because he, he runs, he runs well enough. He's and athletic he's enough. Cannon. He's got a cannon for an arm. So that helps. Uh, the contact rates I'm a little concerned about the fringy. Yeah. The power, the exit velocities are average, but he elevates consistently. He knows how to leverage his hitters counts really well. And when you know how to how to try to swing for the fences pull side and, and elevate and backspin, yeah. I, I, there's a big league role here for sure, and, and he it's going to just put a lot of pressure on his ability to tap into the power consistently enough and or make enough contact. But when you walk the way he walks, nobody walks more than him professionally. He, he's improved defensively. I like his profile a lot more in a corner outfield, and you know the makeup. I'll bet on that makeup any day of the right. week. Um, He's a big leaguer one way or another, even if it's a platoon guy. But I, I think there's enough there offensively to be a regular. I think so. Um, look at him. I think the last week putting the ball in play. When I saw him, like he was, you know, walks in K's both, you know, much, much greater than the amount of games that he has played. But I feel like he's putting the ball in play a little bit more over the last couple of games. Um, the thing that makes him so valuable when he does swing the bat, I feel like is the thing that, you know, we talk about a lot on the Just Baseball show when it comes to a guy like Isak Paredes, where he just has a natural field of backspin. And Paredes, the joke is pull side all the time. And Malloy can hit it really well to the opposite field, too. I remember a spring training homer in Dunedin that he, like, punched out and got out in a hurry in right center. So the EVs aren't great. How do you make the most of your, quote-unquote, three true outcome type build at the plate? It's by elevating all the time and hoping that you catch the the jet stream enough. And, and he does that enough. So this is a guy that had 23 homers last year, 17 the year before that. He's good enough to get it done. Um, but man, like I watch some games that he'll go through and he'll get into a 3-2 count every single time. And I'm like, yeah. it's borderline passive, but like you make it work and I'm not going to ding you for that because you're still very productive. My concern is, you know, at the big league level, you know, you get one pitch to hit in that bat sometimes, and then you're deep in a count three, two, man. Like you, you, you may not see a fastball. You might see, no, you might still see a bang. You're flipping a coin, man. Like I don't want at bats to come down to coin flips. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, one other subtle thing with him is, you know, he starts with his hands low and he crushes low pitches but he doesn't really bring them up to a slot. A lot of guys that start low, well, you'll see them bring them up. He yeah. starts low well and kind of keeps them well. And I was like, how the hell does he get to high pitches? He really doesn't. Like that, <laughs> top third of the zone, like it's the numbers aren't good there, but he's so disciplined. I'm talking about like Mike Trout and laying off of those pitches up there. Like he's so disciplined that it, it, I think he hedges that issue. So he's just going to need to continue to elevate balls at the bottom of the zone like hard sinkers, heavy fastballs, sliders, all the stuff that you're going to be getting, you know, waist high and below. Can you elevate those consistently? I think he can. I love that you use the word punch because that's the word that comes to my mind when I see a swing. And I think he can punch balls the other way in the air. He's quick enough to punch to the pull side. 
but he's going to really hone in on who he is as a hitter, which he has. But I also think there needs to be a little bit more aggression from him. Uh, and, and just, just so you don't get into all of these deep counts um, when you get to the big league level. That said, like there, there's a big league role here. The makeup being, you know, 80, the plate discipline being 70, the yeah. power being 50 is enough. And then, you know, the, the ability to backspin, like you said, sub 40% ground ball rate. There's enough feel to hit. And the defense has come such a long way in the outfield. Yeah. Number eight, guy who's unfortunately on the shelf. But man, I mean, we watched Sawyer Gibson Long last year, right-hander at the big league level. It was a breakout year for him. What a, what a breakout year for so many Tigers prospects, by the way. Mm -hmm. Gibson Long's older, 26 years old, and on the shelf for a year. So this tells you how confident I am that he's going to be a back end of the rotation starter for the Tigers when he comes back. We saw it last year. Like he he was good through the minor leagues and then great in the big leagues. And I don't think it was a flash in the pan. Gets elite or, or at least very good extension. It's like oh well over seven feet of extension. Wow. He's an above average slider. The changeup was the game changer for him. Second half of the year really found that change up. It's kind of this like split grip change and can kill it down to like 1300 RPM. And that I think really helped him not only fly up to the big leagues, but make that, you know, adjustment and be able to settle in right away at the big league level. He throws strikes. I just, I feel so good about his, his chances of being a back end of the rotation starter. And that's why he gets the edge on Malloy. I think Malloy could end up accumulating more war. But I, I'm going to take the surefire back into the rotation starter, even if I have to wait a year, unfortunately, with the TJ. For sure. And and the way that opposing lineups need to beat Sawyer Gibson Long is by swinging the bat. And those are guys that I know you're always going to side with. I'm always going to side with, too. Like, I, I love guys that are willing to attack as soon as they get up and achieve the dream. And in four starts... This guy was, what, 26 Ks, eight walks? He's yeah. willing to attack the best hitters on the planet. And, and it's one thing if you have the stuff that is capable of doing it. It's another thing to have the moxie and, and the mindset to be willing to do it. And I think he's got a nice hybrid of both where, you know, he's not necessarily got a pitch that, you know, you look at and say that can get anybody in the world out. That can get mm -hmm. anybody in the world to swing and miss but he's willing to test it against anybody in the world. And, and that is something that I respect so much from starting pitchers. And I think because he's kind of, you know, we talk about like seeing it go through the net and how it gives you confidence. I think yeah. he saw it go through the net a few times, uh, like quite a few times in the upper levels. And it was like, okay, there's something I'm, I'm funky enough. And you, you think about the extension, right? We, we talk about how cross body deliveries, Jack, like, are generally just think about it. If you're firing across your body, it's going to be harder to have extension. He's not a cross body guy, but he's a low release guy. He's six, four and, and he's a five, three release. So usually you also think about it. It's kind of a short arm delivery. Usually if a tall guy is going to have, you know, a lower release or they're really working down the mound and it's going to be really hard to command everything. He is a five, three release with really good extension. So I think that's weird enough. And then he's got two fastballs. He's got the sinker that I think plays well from that release point. And then, of course, a four-seamer is going to play well from that release point. So he's got the sinker that he gets ground balls with, and then he'll buzz the four-seamer up at the top. When he was just throwing the four-seamer, I think it was a little bit too flat. But now, with that big-time run, he gets like 16 inches. And then the four-seamer up to, at the top with the changeup in the slider. It's four legit pitches. Fifth pitch is a cutter he'll mix in on occasion. He's just going to be able to mix it up get enough weak contact. And, and I'm, I'm very confident he's a back end of the rotation starter for the Tigers next year, or whenever he comes back. And uh, they've got a lot of pitching depth all of a sudden, man. So you said what five, three release height. Yeah. And seven feet of extension. Yeah. Isn't that Wheeler? <laughs> yeah. The difference is Wheeler gets like 18 inches of vert <laughs> and throws like 97. Right, we're right. But I'm saying like but just from the release it's characteristics. Yeah. yeah. He, and Wheeler, guess what? Is 6'4", 215, I think. Like, yeah. I, I mean, when you extend that well and you're that low, and I'm not saying like, oh, this guy's Zach Wheeler. Because no, that's no, not no. it at all. What I'm saying is 
you can watch Zach Wheeler. And, and what I've said for the last couple of years, and I'm sure that you think it too, if you watch a good bit of Wheeler starts, is this guy throws bigger than he actually is. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's 6'6". Like, how is he only 6'4"? It's because he uses his legs so well and he gets mm -hmm. so far down on the mound. And he's so low. He's so into his legs when he's throwing. And that makes 97 look like 101. And that's yeah. how he can overpower for eight innings in the postseason. So even if SGL is 92, guess what? 92 can start to look like 96 when you're that long and that far down on the mound. And that is why it jumps on people. One million percent. And that's why he went from, you know, depth arm to maybe a good four. And then that's that's the difference. Because again, he's getting less ride and less VLO and whatever, but he's still getting that unique look and yeah. that edge that not a lot of guys are able to generate. Also shows you how ridiculous Zach Wheeler is, the fact that he's doing that yeah. with elite stuff too. So I always love drawing, you know, drawing to those guys, and it just reminds you that's why we don't have a lot of ace potential prospects that we talk yeah. about although there is one that we're going to talk about in a moment i i'm willing to make a stupid comp make sense like no 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 that made sense no i know but like you hear you hear zach wheeler for sawyer gibson long and it's like shut up dude i guarantee you there are so many listeners that are just like shut up dude what are you well, talking that's about? why i was like that's why i was like elaborate basically yes. I was say, elaborate now elaborate we get there man it's all about getting there <laughs> Uh, another guy with some good characteristics is Troy Melton. And, and I actually, I'll, I'll mention Mike Rothenberg on this one because I know Mike caught him. So I just wanted to shoot Mike a text and say like, hey, you know, the dad is pretty interesting on M Melton. And he, br another breakout last year, by the way. We talk about the themes. Theme for the Tigers is breakout. Um, Melton broke out. Fourth round pick. Didn't have the best college numbers, uh, but really had a nice year last year. Off to eh, start this year, but I'm not too worried about it. Uh mm -hmm. Mike just told me he he just loves the fastball. He he said that that was one that he felt like, you know, really hit the glove when he caught it. You know, that was one that he really felt like it was it was coming at you and it was it was heavy but but also kind of riding up. Uh and and he felt like that alone was going to make him a big league arm. But what we've seen now since then is slider looks above average. Change up is flashed above average. The problem for him is that hasn't been there for him totally this year and then he mixes in a taste breaking curveball. The command has flashed above average as well again early going this year has not been the case but we saw a really good command from him last year it's another guy that just tracks like a high probability back into the rotation starter for me uh and and he's coming off of finally a start that looked a lot more like what we saw last year adjusting to double a by the way 23 year old but you know uh, not not a, a, i think the most polished guy when he was drafted out of san diego state kind of had a click for him in his draft year I had some really you know, rough numbers before that last start against Akron, four innings, five hits, no runs, no walks, three Ks. He just does a good job of getting weak contact, missing enough bats. I just think that the, the issue for him has been those secondaries haven't been there as much this year as they were last year. Uh, but I think they're starting to come back. And again, another guy that I just feel has a good chance of being a back end of the rotation starter. So 377 hitters he faced in 2023. How many home runs did he allow? Probably just a handful, say seven, five. So that is a 1.3% home run rate. Like guys don't take him deep. Yeah. And that's, and, and that with command that he's had, I mean, he walked what six, six, seven percent of batters last year. Like the command, the confidence, the ability to limit hard contacts, keep the ball in the yard. And that'll play in Comerica for sure too. Uh, you know, I just, again, it's just the secondaries. And both have flashed above average. You got a three pitch mix there. Assuming that they come back, he he could be up in the big leagues by next year. Two. Number six, guy that could be in the big leagues you know, next month. Ty Madden, right hander. Some reason in Double A. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, why. know why. I have no idea why. I I'm very curious. Coming off of a fantastic start yesterday, by the way. Against Harrisburg, five innings, three hits, no runs, one walk, seven Ks. Just another safe arm, man. Like I, I just feel really good about his chances of being a rotation piece. And he probably has a little bit more upside. This is a guy that you could dream on three, you know, mid middle rotation upside. Whereas the other guys were talking about fours and fives. It's a first round pick for a reason. Really exploded, bursting onto the scene in Texas. It's a plus heater. It's a plus slider. It's a good cutter. Well, he's mixed in a changeup that's flashed average, and then that taste breaking curve. 
average command, another makeup guy, it's one of the smarter pitchers. Everything I hear about him is how cerebral he is on the mound, how much he likes to, you know, look into how he can sequence better, how he can like catchers, smart catchers love working with time added. Uh, and, and I think that's something that's always going to help a guy that he already, he has good stuff, but it, it's going to help him maybe pitch like he has really good stuff. And that could help him track closer to the three really good chance of being a four, but with, with the intangibles and the direction that the stuff has been going, the Tigers could have a three here. When did the heater become plus? It's a good question. I think in the second half of last year, we really saw something start to change. The characteristics were better, started to get more ride, and he just started throwing harder. And we Dude. just started to see him. I mean, like in the back half of last year, he went from averaging 94, 95 to more 96. And then at the end of the year, I think averaging 97. Like the, he was going up and up and up as the year went on. Gained a tick and a half to two ticks with more ride. Second half of last year would probably be the answer. And he came out in spring training and he was hitting 98 consistently. And he grabbed 99 a couple of times. I was like, who are you? Fun to see you show up. Nice to meet yeah. you. I'm Jack. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of this guy. And I'm a huge fan of the really smart pitchers. Like I feel like I've made that abundantly clear. But his ability to mix with something that is now 96, 97 is phenomenal. And I, it really feels like every mid-rotation starter in professional baseball now in, in 2024 needs to be sitting about 94 with their heater. And like, I don't think we'll see a mid rotation guy that is 92, 93 anymore. I think he's got to be 94, 95 plus. And now that this guy is sitting 95, 96 and will have so many of those other movement profiles that he can turn to. Um, I, I mean, this, this totally feels like a mid rotation guy. Yeah. You'd have to have like outlier characteristics like the yeah. Inaga in the world. And the, the, the Brian Woos, who's still, you know, he's still fighting to prove that he could be a middle rotation right. arm or Bryce Miller or whatever it may be, but I'm with you. Like it's, it's, it's hard to find nowadays. And I, just take a guess, by the way, what you think his fastball strike rate is so far this year through four games. Don't guess too high and ruin it. No, um, I don't think 70% is too high. No, it's not too I don't high. Think, I'll I tell don't you what it was last year, though. It was 63 and a half. Okay. I don't think 72% is too high. It's not. It's 75%. Damn. So he's throwing harder, filling up the zone. And then the slider is right there too at 68%. So the command has gotten better. The fastball has gotten better. And he's mixing in the changeup, the cutter, and even that curve here and there too. It's safe. Very, very, very safe arm. Yes. That is giving us more upside now too. I'm so happy to see this guy back, Jack. Uh, I, probably one of my favorite swings in minor league baseball at this point, just because it is so sound. It is so quick, compact, repeatable. And then you're like, whoa. You can actually run into some balls too. Like there's there's some pop in there. Got a late start to the year with an injury, and through his first two games, first game he had to shake off the rust, only one hit and a stolen base. Then yesterday, three hits, a double, and a stolen base. So already coming out of the gate, looking like Kevin McGonagall hitting 571, no strikeouts through those first two games. He was phenomenal in his pro debut. And I think it's more, it's going to be more of the same this year. It's a top 100 prospect for us for a reason. It's a really sound offensive profile. I think potentially plus to plus plus hit tool, plus plate discipline. The game power, I'm hoping, can get to the fringy range. But even if it's below average, he's still going to hit enough and be gap to gap enough with good enough EVs to, you know, be an, an everyday hitter. Above average speed. We'll see long term where, where his home is defensively. They're still giving him run at shortstop. I think he could be eh there, uh, which is fine. But I think he could be a really good defensive second baseman as well. Uh, but I, this is just such a good bat. Detroit had two picks in the top 37 last year. They got a high school bat with an incredibly high ceiling at three. And they got a high school bat with an incredibly high floor at 37. And I think everybody is seeing that now. Like it, it might have been the case when you saw him in Lakeland last year. Um, you know, hey, 
wait another week, week and a half, you, you'll see that floor really show out in Lakeland this year too. You're going to see a guy hit the ball with a good bit of authority all over the field. And that is like, that's the goods. When you think about a 19 year old kid that like has the chance to shoot up the minor leagues, I mean, you know, 2026 feels right, but it could be like break camp 2026. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I think he is the candidate of the type of guy that can just fly through the ranks. He had an oppo homer in the Florida state league last year too. And I don't think anybody was really expecting him to, to, to be able to do that right out of the gate. The, the power flashes to the pull side though. We saw some one Oh sixes, one Oh sevens to the pull side. And I think that's going to continue to, to get better for him too. I think he's going to tap into a little bit more in that first game or, or in the second game yesterday already popped a one Oh six. So he hits the ball hard. Uh, and I think there's like this, Daniel Murphy type of look to him that I really like. I think he could hit. He could be one of those guys that if it all comes together, hits like 40 doubles. <laughs> it's just like, just yeah. a doubles machine and sprinkles in enough home runs. I don't know if he's going to have as much power as Murphy's a bigger guy, but I do, I do see some of those similarities there. Uh, and this is a dude that I would sleep very soundly within my farm system, knowing that there's not much that he needs to do other than just get ABs and get experience. And we'll figure out where the defense ends up. But yeah, uh, don't have to worry about the bat. And you think he can be a factor on the base pass. You think that he can speed up defenses with a ground ball to the left side. Yes. Yeah. He's above average runner, very heady and quick. So he gets good jumps. I think base stealing is going to be part of his game too. Cool. Number four, Jace Young. You 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 saw Jace so far? Yeah, this I loved seeing Jace Young. Tell me what you saw. Second base slash third base, triple A. If there's room... He could be up soon. What did you see? I loved what I saw from Jace Young. I saw a guy that has an innate ability to elevate to the pull side. <laughs> and, you know, that's something that I really wasn't keyed on, keyed in on with him until he got to West Michigan. And West Michigan, you just saw a Twitter clip after Twitter clip after Twitter clip. And then, like, he's made his way up. And now in Toledo, all of a sudden, you know, you get a look at him hitting balls harder than I was expecting and in the air way more than I was expecting. He and Josh are both just ball players. They're pure ball players. And I think he does a really good job of leaning into what makes him really good. And it is mitigating, you know, that, that maybe lack of feel to hit that you've got, like you've got a 45 future 40 present. He's so direct and it looks weird. Like the setup looks really weird, right? Because the bat is, is pointing straight up. It's not a Craig Council thing because the hands are lower, but that in turn creates this direct plane that you really don't get for many guys. He's very direct, but he he elevates with a direct swing that I doesn't really make sense because when you think direct, I think batted balls on the ground, but he bucks that trend somehow. And I think that might just be natural gift. It's it's the turn, right? Like so with guys, you know, the, the quickest way to get to the ball would be to just go straight down to it. You yeah. don't want to do that. So the, some of the most elite you know, power guys are guys that can turn that barrel around and get it in the zone as as quickly as possible without because it's, it's a long journey if you think about it. You're turning the barrel all the way around and then you want it to go, you know, enter the zone on plane. So Jace somehow figured out, like, hey, if I set up like this it's really easy for me to turn that barrel and get in the zone really quick and, and keep it that way. A lot of guys I think would be in and out of the zone with that angle and, and just turning it so quickly and kind of be spinny and pull off of it. Or they're he under stayed, everything. They're swinging under everything because the barrel's going to dip. He seems to have just found what works for him. And I'm sure he got some pushback on that at some point, but you see when he swings, the, it's a guy that knows his body, knows his moves and knows what works for him. That move, though, yeah, sure. It's, it, it, when you're selling out a little bit for lift and you're really focused on on turning the barrel and and elevating, yeah, you're gonna have some you know some blue zones, especially at the top. It, it can be tough sometimes, but he's he can get to pitchers in tough spots. He swings hard. I was talking to a, a Texas Tech teammate of theirs that played with both of them, and he said that without a doubt in his mind, Jace Young has more power than Josh, and that wasn't an indictment on Josh. He thinks Josh is an all star, but. Said so Jace has more power, man. Um, and I thought that was interesting because you know, Josh hits the ball really hard, but Jace hits it just as hard and elevates consistently. And I think that's kind of the thing that Josh had been missing, which is the irony in it. Uh, but I, I think that this is a guy that even if the hit tool is a 40 45, 
he's going to elevate so consistently. He hits the ball so hard. And, you know, he does not miss mistakes. I love the way that he's able to get that barrel in the zone early. Uh, and and even if it is, you know, he doesn't have as much adjustability as some other guys, he's not going to miss pitches that that he should be hitting out because of how consistently repetitive his swing is and that plane is and that path is. He, he's going to be a good piece. And I like that they're playing him at third. I, I don't have a lot of confidence in him being a great third baseman, but was, you know he's going to slug enough to play there. And you know if he can turn into a, an average defensive third baseman, which I think he, he can ultimately, um, you know th- that's a little bit more valuable too. I tell you, he looked fine at third base, like, and and that's okay because right now they're running out Matt for and Matt Veerling and like, hey, Matt Veerling is a big leaguer, but is he an everyday third baseman? No. Is Giovanni Urshela at this point an everyday third baseman? No. So no. let's let's see what we got here. I think some assortment of Colt Keith and Jace Young splitting second and third makes a ton of sense. And those are guys like whoever you put at second base is going to lack mobility of a good second baseman. Whoever you put at third base is going to maybe lack the quick instincts and the cannon of a good third baseman. But you get the offensive value and the profile from both of those. And like, I'm okay with that if I'm the Tigers moving forward. Absolutely. This seems going to be so fun, man. Like it already yeah. is fun, but it's going to get it's going to be real fun. good real soon. I love it. I love it. Number three, Max Clark, first round pick, number three overall, Detroit Tigers, of course, but uh, not the start that he may have wanted to his professional career. It was a brief taste last year, but all of a sudden now, heating up and really heating up. And I think this is what we were kind of expecting, right? Like we we saw some mechanical adjustments. You just see how quick the bat is. You see how fast he is in general, how patient he is in the box overall. And you're kind of wondering why the results weren't there in low A. And then over his last few games, I, I would say more than a few, has really started to catch fire and, and, and lean into you know, who he is. He's in over 400 in his last 10. I, I do wonder how much power is in there. He did crush one, like 104, 400 feet to the pole side. But going the other way a little bit more this year, he's scorching line line drives you know, between first and second plenty. And when he beats it in the ground, he's got a great chance to beat it out. So I, I don't mind that it's on the ground a little bit. He's walking nearly as much as he struck out which over the last 10 games, which you love to see. It seemed like he was kind of struggling a bit in the early parts of this year with his new moves and kind of just the new pre-swing moves, the new setup. It seemed like he just was getting taken out of his swing some, didn't have the same body control that we had seen in the past, and now he's settling in to those new moves and settling into you know being Max Clark, I think. And Max Clark is an elite defensive center fielder with a rocket for an arm who could project as a plus hitter and give you enough power from the left side and the ability to get on base. It's a really good player. Would I be fair in saying that he's one of the freakiest athletes we have in the minor leagues? For sure. I think when you incorporate the arm, the bat speed, the elite speed, and, you know, just the kind of everything that he brings to the table, just kind of being like a muscle hamster too. Like, yeah, I think it's totally fair. Yeah. I, that's the thing that jumps out to me. And like, I got to see him live when he was in high school, his senior year of high school. And I was just like, you don't look like a normal 18 year old. Like what, what's going on with you here? And the answer is like, he was the best player in the country. Like one of the best high school players in America at that point. So like, that's what you got to look like to be the top of the top of the top. And and he has been working at a very high level for a long time now. And, you know, you've seen the YouTube videos, like he's, he's up, you know, weird hours in the morning, deadlifting an absurd amount of weight for a guy that moves that well. And like, Hey, Shout out Max Clark. But, you know, the thing is like that translates into freakish athleticism and twitch. Yeah, twitch. I want to give guys the credit for that because it's not all God given. Some Mm -hmm. of it is, but a lot of it is a testament to the work that guys put in. So when we say physical specimen, a physical specimen at 6'1", 195, like tip of the hat to you, Max Clark, you've worked really hard to, you know, create this physical specimen type being for yourself. So good on you. And and that is what gives him that crazy high ceiling. My yeah. question for you is when does the slug really start to come into play? Cause I think that was part of the billing with him. It's, Oh yeah. He, he, you know, has a great feel to hit. He moves so well, but he also like the bat speed, like you're, you're pointing to, 
is that going to translate to homers or is that going to translate to stings a ball into right center and left center and he's going to lead the league in triples with Comerica's as home ballpark? I think more the latter. I do think that the power is going to come more. And I do think we can see he could have seasons of 20 home runs when he really gets into him pull aside and things like that. But yeah, I think that was one of the things that was slightly oversold in the draft because it's just not really who he who he is. And and you know, I don't know if I want to see him selling out for that. He hits the ball hard on a line and 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 drives it to all fields. And I think that's kind of what you want him to do. Again, certain spots. Your whole leverage is counts and, and like the one home run that you see right here, this was already this this year. He can yank one pull side and really get into it. I, I thought the like highest ceiling in the draft thing that like Scott Harris said was a, a little silly because I think he has a lot of tools and has a lot of potential. And I do think could grow into average power, but like oh, come on, are we we think this guy is gonna hit 30 home runs? Like I, I don't think so. I, that's not who he is, and he can be a perennial all-star not doing that he can be one of the better defensive set center fielders with elite stolen base ability with a plus hit tool who hits a ton of doubles and still hits you 15 maybe 20 home runs but i i never understood the like plus power thing um you know and i don't think we've really seen that what i do love about clark too is and this guy was the man right and was celebrated as you know what the like you said arguably the best high school player that, we, that we'd seen and doesn't like how he does, you know, performed that first little pro stretch. And he works his butt off both in the gym, like you said, like a lot of guys do that, but also yeah. the willingness to make mechanical adjustments to the swing. Guys that have been good at their whole lives and not face much adversity at all, you say, oh, it was just a little slump. I'm going to go back out there. And he could have come back out this year with the same setup, same swing, had the same limitations. And then he'd be a little bit later to this turnaround and this start that now that he's had. So, I think the willingness to adjust while still maintaining that ridiculous confidence that he has is is impressive, and I think that's something that's going to you know bode well for him as he continues to climb. I think ultimately there could be average game power, maybe a little bit more if it all comes together. But to me, I see more of that you know Jacoby Ellsbury type of, of mm. profile, and you know Ellsbury again had some years where he ran into him, but I think that was a little bit more park dependent. You put Max Clark in Yankee Stadium, yeah, maybe I could see twenty five there. Uh, but I, I think ultimately it's the speed, it's the defense, and it's the feel to hit and ability to get on base that makes him good. And then hitting the ball so hard consistently is why he's going to have a lot of doubles, a high BABIP, and you know ultimately the slug will look good, whether it's home runs, doubles, and triples. Like he's he's going to slug enough regardless. Yeah. That's a fun comp. I like Jacoby Ellsbury. Yeah. He made a lot of money. Nope. He did make a lot of money. The Yankees probably still paying him. Yeah. Number two, Colt Keith off to a slow start at the big league level. Is he cooked, Jack? Yeah. He's done. Yeah. Uh, cool. Keith, we talked about him on the Just Baseball show. He's fine. Uh, I do think he's getting Comerica a little bit right now. He has a 385 foot fly out, a 380 foot fly out, and a 400, 400 foot fly out. Uh, that stinks. And when you're 20 games into your professional career, those kind of batted balls can start to get in your head a little bit. And I think it might be a little bit because this is a guy that always has elevated consistently. That's why I've loved his offensive profile above average contact rates, above average EVs elevating with a good approach. So far, he's been putting the ball on the ground a lot more. Yeah. I think some of that is that he's been aggressive and pressing a bit, uh, especially with fastballs. I, and this happens a lot with young guys. Oh, I'm in the big leagues. These guys are nasty. I can't miss my fastball. I can't miss the fastball. I need to hit the fastball when I get it. That doesn't mean that you swing at all the fastballs that you get. Mm -hmm. And so far, he's chasing fastballs at a 32% clip and then all other pitches well below that. So I think that's part of what's happening here. He's going to settle right in. I talked about him as, a well, I think, one of the safest offensive profiles in baseball, you know, minor league baseball last year. And then what do the Tigers do? They end up extending him. If that doesn't reinforce that belief, uh, I don't know what will. And 22 games is not enough to do the opposite of that <laughs> and not reinforce that. So uh, I, I think he's going to be just fine. It's not like he's getting overpowered. It's still a sub 20% K rate. I just like to see him be a little bit more selective. But when we're talking about what Cole Keith can be as a player, we talked about him in the top 100. It's yeah. plus power potential. It's above average hit. And the defense, by the way, He's great now. He's a good defender so far at second base. How about that? Yeah. I think if they commit to one spot with him, he can be a solid defender. 
he was just bouncing in between. And we saw what that did to Bobby Witt Jr. when he was at short and third. And I know that was short and third compared to, you know, second and third. But like Bobby Witt couldn't create an identity anywhere. And he was just like, all right, what do we got going on here? And he did not grade out as a good defender at all. He was a bad defender. And now guess what? Oh, he's got a consistent home. He's one of the better defenders in all of Major League Baseball. Okay. I'm not saying that Cole Keith is going to be one of the better defenders in all of Major League Baseball, but it could be a Marcus Semyon thing where Semyon and like, again, it, it is Semyon always grades out as an elite defender at shortstop, but he was a bad short or he was a bad shortstop. He always grades out as an elite defender at second base. He was a bad shortstop. You've got Keith that was kind of bouncing between two. He was below average at both. You put him at one, you kind of close that. All of a sudden, he can become good if he gets to take reps at the same place every day and not have to worry about another. So he's young, like he's got time to do it. Um, that's an important point about the K rate that I'm glad that you mentioned. Like he doesn't suck. He's got a sub 20% K rate. This is more bad luck than some of the other guys that are punching out at a 40% clip. I think it's a little bit of bad luck. It's a little bit of aggressiveness and it's just a little, a little too much weak contact early in counts. Like we are talking about with big B and triple a right now. Um, and, and I think like going back to the other point, you just got to see one go through. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. he's got to see one get over the wall yeah. in right center that has just been evading him a, a bit. I think ultimately that the space in Comerica will play to his favor. Cause that guy loves to split the gaps and, it may suppress the power a bit. A guy that I do think could hit 30 home runs in a neutral site may only hit 20 to 25 here until he really starts getting comfortable with the pull side pop. And he's a guy that uses the whole field. I don't want him to be discouraged from doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I love the offensive profile as much as ever. Of course, I'm not concerned about it. And you have the ability to, you you have a guy here that has the ability to hit, you know, in the high 200s, 275, let's say, and give you plenty of 30 home run pop and, I want to see him walk a little bit more, but now the defense being where it is, this is a guy where it all, when it all comes together, can give you four or five win seasons. Yeah. Last but not least, Jackson Job coming off of a Jackson Job start. Finally, a little bit of a shaky beginning to the season that we had talked about on previous episodes. Now the right-hander, I had a really fun time watching his last outing. The changeup was back. 50 of his 66 pitches were for a strike. Mm. And he goes four innings, three hits, two runs, one walk, five Ks. But it was it was Jackson Job. You know, after the first inning, he settled right back in. And it was what we were used to seeing last year, which was one of the best strike throwers in minor league baseball with some of the best stuff. In that outing, fastball strike rate was 71%. Changeup strike rate was 71%. Slider strike rate was 85%. And then he, the, the cutter strike rate was 82%. That was like what he was doing last year when he was basically punching out the world and walking nobody, 103 punches, 11 walks. If you combine the Arizona fall league as well uh, last year, we're talking about a plus plus heater, a plus plus slider, (laughs) a plus change up and an above average cutter with what I do think ultimately is plus command. That is your one a or one B pitching prospect in baseball, whether or not he had two bad starts to start the season or not. I'm going to call my shot on this one too and I'm, I can't wait for this to age poorly next outing. I think he goes nuts. I think we're seeing eight, 10 K's next outing. And how many walks? One. Okay. I like that. The Jackson job that is eight K's one walk is the one that is one, a one B with skeins. Like that's, that's the pitch last year's numbers was the pitch. The fall league was the pitch. Um, first two starts it sucks because he was measured as 1a 1b with skeins and then skeins does what he does for his first three starts and job does what he does for his first two starts and it's like how are these two even close because he's got this in the tank and he did it every time out last year and if he's back to doing it every time out that is a guy that is arguably the best pitching prospect in the game the change up that he was throwing in that last outing just crazy fade to it, just falling off the table. And that pairing was a pitch that we found last year. And and pairing that with a 70 fastball and 70 slider is imp- – that's final boss shit. Yeah. And then a low 90s cutter that he's going to buzz in on your hands. Through his first three starts, fastball strike rate was 70%, but he had a 
slider strike rate of 55%, change up strike rate of 45%, and a cutter strike rate of 50%. Just to like give you a reference, sorry for throwing so many percentages, but slider last year was over 65, change up last year was over 70%, and a chase rate over 50. And a, the cutter last year was a 67% strike rate. So that's why I said like, I'm going to side with the 20 game sample than the yeah. two game sample. And I think we already saw now in the third game that he's back to kind of what we're used to. I do wonder how much of the cold weather was a part of that. We talked about that a little bit um, being a Texas kid. And you know, last year really didn't pitch in the cold weather at all. Uh, and it, you know, the, the sliders, a field pitch, he's getting over 3000 RPMs on that. Uh, the, the split change is, is also very much a field pitch. And the cutter is more of that, just that natural fastball. But I, I, I still will take this guy right there with Skeens. I still, he's still my number one pitching prospect in baseball because when that is all on, I think that the arsenal works off of itself and the pitches work off of each other as well as any you're going to see. And the fastball shape just looks really good right now. Um, I'm excited to see if he gets rolling now, how they handle him to get up to the big leagues, you know, at some point this year. I think so if they need him. Again, it's just a testament to the pitching depth that they have. But this is like that Grayson Rodriguez type of situation where you've got three plus pitches, a solid fourth, and plus command. Now, I know Grayson didn't have all of that show last year, but up until that last start he had, it was showing in the early part this year. It's just so rare to get guys with this kind of arsenal and this kind of command. We talk about Skeens and Joe, like that's it. It's very hard to find frontline starters like we talk about prospects and people are like oh how is he a guy christian scott like, why do you say number three or you know fringe two he's you know striking all these guys out because they're you might gotta be have 10 aces in major league baseball yes you gotta have 360s and maybe 270s to be and and good command to be an ace yeah like there are maybe 10 guys maybe yeah i saw espn put together a list of i think nine aces kylie mcdaniel did uh did like an ace ranking. And, and I think there were nine of them. And there were a couple of guys that were, um, you know, medically DQ'd, like DeGrom, ace, medically DQ'd. I think Sandy, ace, medically DQ'd. I think he had Bueller as an ace that was medically DQ'd too. So like, it, it's that kind of thing. But man, like, I mean, he didn't have Shane McClanahan in there. I disagree with that. But yeah, like, I, I mean, there are very few. There are 10. And just because your favorite team has a one, doesn't mean that he's an ace Correct. and Correct. Job has ace potential. I think he's one of two and maybe three. If you said painter as well, painter, um, I think know, painter. I love, I love Cade Horton. Love him. He's not he's a ace. two. He's a two. I think, you know, maybe even a three really good one. And it's the probability of him being a three that, that makes him so good. And, and, you know, he could be a high end two and an ace. Uh, maybe he's a one for, you know, a middling team. That's the yeah. difference. Uh, but Joe, one of two pitchers, two and a half, if you count Painter, that can legitimately be an ace in Major League Baseball. That'll do it for this episode. We'll do draft with you tomorrow. Hope you enjoyed it. Of course, the link is in the episode description to follow along. You can subscribe to those bonus call-up episodes. The link in the episode description as well. We are answering. We're doing a mailbag for subscribers this week. Very excited about that. Uh, and keep an eye out on JustBaseball.com. We've got that mock draft live already on the website. A lot more prospect content continuing to go out. Those pitchers and hitters roundups every single week that you can expect right around Monday, Tuesday. That's always a lot of fun. Any final thoughts, Jack? I don't think so. Good stuff. Right. I, I really like where this Tigers top 10 is at. This, this team in general, it's, it's a good time to be a Tigers fan. All of these guys are getting closer to the big leagues. Javier Baez's deal is getting closer to being done. A lot of talent up there. My is time on that, man. Still have a couple years <laughs> on that one. My is every day is closer. It's like when you're in prison, you just X out. Each yeah. um, but no, th this is a great time to be a Tigers fan. And I hope we made you a little bit more excited about it. We'll talk draft with you tomorrow.